A dangerous surge of coronavirus cases in the United States. What's behind the increase and why are so many hospitals being pushed to their limits? Hello, I'm Mike Walter and this is The Heat. The United States is once again shattering records over the last week. The U.S. averaged more than 70,000 new coronavirus cases a day. The U.S. leads the world with the highest number of cases. To date, some 8.8 .8 million people have been infected in the U.S. with more than 227,000 deaths. The World Health Organization says as cases accelerate in the U.S. and Europe, some governments may need to impose stricter measures. The next few months are going to be very tough and some countries are on a dangerous track. Too many countries are seeing an exponential increase in cases, and that's now leading to hospitals and ICU running close or above capacity, and we're still only in October. For more on COVID-19 in the United States, let's bring in our panel. Joining us from Madison, Wisconsin, is Dr. Jeff Pothoff. He's the Chief Quality Officer and Emergency Physician at the University of Wisconsin Health System. Also with us from New York is Dr. Calvin Soon. He is an attending physician and clinical assistant professor in emergency medicine. Here in Washington, D.C., Dr. Kate Tolinko is the CEO and founder of Corvus Health. That's a global health firm. And Joseph Williams is a senior news editor with U.S. News and World Report. Jeff, why don't I start with you? Uh, let's start in Wisconsin. Uh, a grim milestone this week, hitting over 200,000 cases. Uh, the governor of the state, Tony Evers, had some very stark words. Let's listen to what he had to say. There's no way to sugarcoat it. We are facing an urgent crisis, and there is an imminent risk to you, your family members, your friends, your neighbors, and the people you care about. Talk to us about the urgency. I mean, hospital beds, uh, the last I saw, about 85% of capacity. What do things look like there in Madison for you? You know, we're actually in pretty rough shape here uh, in Madison and in the rest of the state. You know, it's been frightening how easily this virus has been able to disseminate among our communities. You know, hospital capacity is really full. Uh, that 85% number uh, is a real number, but, you know, some of that 15% of beds remaining we can't take care of COVID patients in them. They might be, you know, psychiatric beds, uh, beds that we use for research purposes. Uh, so, you know, we're meeting multiple times per day just to figure out how to make patients fit uh, and creating uh, modifying spaces to generate additional ICU space in our hospitals. So that's the strain on the hospital. But what about the strain on you and, and those in your field who actually have to deal with this? I mean, it's, it's not something where you, it's a nine to five. This is 24-7, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a tale of two cities. So on one hand, healthcare workers, we are exhausted. Uh, we have put in so many hours. Uh, there's the stress of wondering, are we going to give this to our family? Are we going to get sick ourselves? But on the other side, uh, there's this camaraderie, this team spirit, where I feel that most of us uh, know that we're part of something bigger than ourselves. Uh, and despite, you know, asking more of healthcare workers than we had any right to ask of them, they continue to sign up for shifts. They continue to show up at work. Uh, and that's been nothing short of inspiring. And Jeff, we look at the figures. Uh, it took seven months to get to 100,000. From 100,000 to 200,000, that's just five weeks. So that shows the speed of, of transmission. What's behind the surge? What can be done to stop it? You know, there's probably a lot of factors. But, you know, uh, two that we worry about the most is, one, uh, people are just tired of COVID-19. They're tired of mitigation efforts, uh, and uh, they just don't want to mask anymore. They don't want to distance. Uh, on top of that, uh, at least in Wisconsin, we haven't had clear guidance from leaders. We might have one leader say, you know what, the situation is dire, be very careful. Another leader will say, you know what, COVID-19 is not that big of a deal. And I think what happens as people try to formulate what amount of risk they're comfortable with, uh, they don't know who to believe, and they're making inaccurate calculations of the risk that they're putting themselves at uh, as they go about their normal lives. Calvin, if anybody knows about uh, mixed messages, uh, you were in New York during uh, the height of the pandemic as it was coursing through New York City. Uh, the state still has the highest death toll, over 33,000. You had a governor saying one thing, a president of the United States saying something else. Talk to us about that and, and these kind of mixed messages. How does that play into all of this? And what are your concerns as you look at New York now? 
Thank you for having me back. And I swear, if you asked me what you just asked Dr. Potov uh, just uh, in March, I would have said exactly the same thing. I feel like a huge sense of deja vu has come upon me, or modern day Cassandra, or literally everything I had said in March is being repeated in October. I cannot believe that we're still going through this. I think the only difference now is that we're a little better at treating this virus. Um, despite, not, yeah, in spite of, all right, in spite of the mixed messages that we've gotten from everyone. Remember in March and April, we didn't know who to test, where to test, where to send the tests, whether we had any tests, let alone if steroids are good, if steroids are bad, whether to intubate, not to intubate, let alone 50,000 people are coming in uh, everywhere in our whole hospital system, and we didn't have enough PPE. And we're still dealing with that now. And there are people who are stretched to the capacity where we wonder anything that we said in March and April, did it not reach people? Did it fall on deaf ears? And I, I credit to Dr. Potov and everyone else around the country trying to do their best, but without a clear leadership with mixed messages, we failed to prepare. So we can only prepare to fail. And Calvin, we're talking a lot of numbers, and I'm going to talk about them again in this show. Uh, you know, 227,000 deaths. We seem to fixate on that. But there's 8.8 .8 million people who've been infected. Now, a lot of those people, asymptomatic, some had mild cases. But as you know, there's a lot of long haulers out there. And I think about COVID and, and the tail of COVID, which could last more than months. It could last years. I mean, this could be a story we're talking about two years from now. We don't know how long this is going to be with people. Talk to us about that. Yeah, we're talking about a virus that we don't have in, in a full year to actually fully understand it. We don't even know what the long-term sequelae is in a virus that hasn't been around for more than, at least in the United States, eight months. So there's just so much more to know and learn about. We know that it's mutating. We know that there's supposedly at least six strains around the world. Uh, it's becoming more contagious, uh, less lethal. But even then, if it's more contagious, more people come to the ER. ERs become fuller. It's not like people suddenly stop having appendicitis. People stop having other diseases. And it becomes harder and harder to treat all our patients adequately. So there's going to be more death as a result of a, of a virus that we know very, very little about. I think it's remarkable already that within eight months, we know that steroids are beneficial. Uh, we know that intubation needs to be reserved for the last absolutely possible, last possible resort. And we know about silent hypoxia. I mean, we also have to credit to a, a large amount of information sharing that Dr. Paul mentions within our community that we are better able to fight back. This is a war. There's going to be a give and take, and we're so much better at fighting this virus. But at the same time, it's not like we're completely in the clear. This is going to be a long haul for all of us, not just the disease process, but also on ourselves as healthcare workers, the community, and our mental health. Let alone once this is all over and the vaccines come around, let's hopefully everyone takes it and we all come out of this. What about all of us healthcare workers who are struggling with not even having the time to recharge and heal from this process and just feel like we've been left in the dust and left to die, literally? Uh, Kate, uh, Calvin's making a lot of good points. I mean, you know, initially back in March, he's groping around in the dark trying this and that. Uh, at least, you know, now in Wisconsin, they do know, know how to probably approach this in a much more effective way when you're just kind of learning about the virus. But we're still seeing remarkable numbers. Uh, the United States averaging 71,000 cases per day, uh, major outbreaks in many states. Uh, beginning on Friday, restaurants in Chicago will no longer be able to serve indoors. Just how alarming is this? It is very concerning. And if there are two terms I would like your audience to come away with today, one is crisis standards of care, and the other is critical access hospitals. So crisis standards of care, that's when hospitals become so overwhelmed that they can't give the normal standard of care. We saw that in New York in the spring, and we're now seeing that in Utah, where the Utah Hospital Association has asked the governor for permission to institute these crisis standards of care. And within those standards, it includes withholding care from older people and withholding care from people who are considered higher risk for other reasons. So this is extremely concerning. And then the critical access hospitals. These are rural hospitals, often very small, 20 to 30 beds. Often they don't have ICU beds. And they are subsidized by the government to stay open because they serve extremely rural and remote communities. Many of these hospitals have been closing down, particularly now because one of their main sources of income of uh, uh, elective surgeries has been stopped by COVID. There are 50 counties in Georgia that don't have a single hospital. So we're going to see hospitals overwhelmed with more COVID patients 
coming in. It's extremely concerning. You're talking about a perfect storm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And although we are seeing lower mortality rates because we do have better treatment modalities, if we have more people sick and if we have more hospitals overwhelmed, we will see more people dying. And, you know, as, as Dr. Sun uh, alluded to, you know, the, there's certainly the, the tragedy of the uh, over 2,200,000 uh, um, uh, um, uh, people that have died from COVID in the U.S., but I think actually the, the worst part of this story will be the chronic disability, the people who have uh, chronic lung disability or have chronic heart problems, or actually now we're finding out chronic neurological problems coming after COVID. So this has not been, I think, um, uh, covered as much as it should be. Yeah, well, there's so many stories out there uh, for each one of these people. They've got family members affected as well. Uh, Joseph, of course, there's a political dimension to all of this. We've got an election. It's a, a week from now. Um, is this going to be a referendum on the president's handling of this pandemic? Well, I certainly I think, think that... Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Joseph. Uh, I, I think that, that it's nothing other than... I mean, if it's not nothing if a referendum on uh, President Trump's uh, leadership and his handling of this crisis. I mean, all the numbers just kind of run together after a while. But uh, if you think about them and break them apart a little bit, uh, you're talking about nine, roughly 900 people, close to 1,000 people who died today. Uh, and that's the size of a large apartment building in, in, in a mid-sized city. I mean, you think about that number alone, uh, that, that, that they died today and they're dying every day, and yet you have the president uh, mocking it on the campaign trail. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I think it's going to be a referendum on him, because even the man himself uh, came down with, with, with COVID-19, and yet is, is, is very cavalier about it, is holding large rallies, and those rallies, uh, some are saying, are responsible for very large clusters. So when you talk about the overworked hospitals, the overstrained hospital workers, uh, the hospitals that are running out of beds, uh, a second surge uh, that's coming right around the holidays and election day, and the threat, the looming threat of another potential shutdown, it is very clear that this is going to be one of, one of President Trump's legacies, if not the reason why he has a really rough time on November 3rd. And Joseph, let's say he has a rough time on, on November 3rd. Uh, this election goes the way the polls suggest. Joseph Biden becomes the next president. What does he need to do to get a handle on this? Well, first and foremost, he needs to talk to the people and give clear accurate information based on science. A lot of people are kind of yearning for this, but they're not getting it from the president. Uh, one of your guests earlier talked about mixed messages coming from uh, different leaders. Uh, certainly the federal government has a large role to play here, so I think President Biden needs to step up and coordinate, uh, if a, pres a potential President Biden needs to step up and coordinate uh, all the uh, organizations that he has at his disposal and give a clear message to the people. Even that said, though, we still have a lot of governors out there of red states. We have a lot of mayors who don't want to see businesses suffer because of a mask mandate, which they say President Biden is, is, is going to implement on day one. Now, that's going to set up another set of conflicts, but I think people uh, are yearning for this kind of information. And if it happens the way the polls seem to suggest that it happens, uh, he would arrive with a mandate, and that should tamp down a lot of the noise. And Kate, I, I know you wanted to jump in on the referendum question. I've seen you nodding your head. I, I, I want to give you a chance to jump in here. Well, I think that the, uh, the COVID pandemic is going to affect voting in a number of ways. It's going to affect whether or not people vote, whether they feel safe voting. It's going to affect the mechanism by which they vote, for example, voting in mail versus early versus on Election Day. And it's also going to affect who they vote for. And, and I do think that, uh, uh, that it, on that level, it will be a referendum. And if we do see a, a Biden win, you know, my recommendations would be a, a universal a mask mandate for indoor public public spaces, the Defense Production Act used for uh, producing more um, uh, protective equipment, more treatments and, and on the vaccines, and also a, a national app for contact tracing, because we still don't have that. And we've had many states like North Dakota, which have just given up on doing contact tracing. And Kate mentioned vaccines. Uh, Dr. Potoff, I know that you were one of the first recipients to take this uh, AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine as part of a major study. Talk to me about your, your uh, interest in being involved in that and, and what was the experience like? Yeah, so it was, you know, early September, uh, we had uh, brought the clinical trial to the University of Wisconsin. And, uh, you know, as one of the leaders in the organization, what I wanted to do was, was show the community that, uh, you, you know, this is a, a safe thing to do, you know, assess your risk. 
Uh, and enough of us sign up for these phase three clinical trials that will prove a safe and effective vaccine. You know, that's really how we put the closing chapters on this COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so I wanted to get out there, model the way, show people it was okay, uh, in the hopes of uh, talking to other people, recruiting other people into the trial. Any side effects, anything to report? No, I mean, I had some mild symptoms the, the night that I had, had gotten the shot, uh, some chills, uh, no fever, a headache the next day. Uh, but quite frankly, that was it. It was really mild. And since then, I felt great. And Kate, we've got, uh, I guess, 11 vaccines uh, entering the phase three uh, efforts, including the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine that he's uh, referring to. Um, Dr. Fauci talked about this. Let's listen to what he had to say. We will know whether a vaccine is safe and effective by the end of November, the beginning of December. The question is, once you have a safe and effective vaccine or more than one, how can you get it to the people who need it as quickly as possible? So the amount of doses that will be available in December will not certainly be enough to vaccinate everybody. And Kate, that's one of the problems. I mean, this isn't just idea, it's execution. And the execution becomes just as difficult in many respects, doesn't it? Yes, absolutely. And some of the vaccine makers have started making vaccine ahead of time. For example, Pfizer, you know, they still haven't concluded their vaccine trial, but they've started mass producing it in the hopes that they will eventually get, get approval. And then, you know, states will start to decide how will they prioritize who gets it. It'll probably be uh, frontline healthcare workers first, uh, older people in, uh, in nursing homes, and then high risk people from there. Uh, and and uh, Calvin, let me talk to you a little bit about uh, therapeutics. Uh, you know, you mentioned that you're kind of, you know, when you were back there in March, you're just kind of grasping at straws, trying to come up with, with any approach you can. But now at least there's some regimens in place. Talk to us about the therapeutics. Where are we moving there? Well, we have to risk stratify the people who come to the emergency room first. How sick are they? Are they hypoxic? What are their vital signs? What are their medical history? I do like to individualize treatment uh, up until the mass casualty scenario, which is also what I'm tra trained in. Uh, back in March and April, we didn't have enough resources. We were considering you know, rational, rationing medical care, rationing ventilators. We had all these plans in place. And that was based on a widespread how to control the infection. Uh, if those people who had symptoms but were not hypoxic, we educate them on what we knew about silent hypoxia, if that information came about, and educate them self-quarantining. And I think that was the best, in, term, in my opinion, of uh, confection control. We did not want an emergency room full of sick patients coughing to the air, whether they were even people with dementia who didn't know how to put on a mask, just spreading the viral load, uh, giving to other people, and having people die in the emergency rooms because they're waiting 50 hours for a bed. So try to decompress that. But now we're in an individual case-by-case -case basis in New York because we're now been very good. At, we we ch decided to choose to listen to um, our governor and our mayor in terms of locking down and micro-locking, like kind of doing like a microsurgery instead of a machete uh, in trying to control the embers that are flickering in New uh, Brooklyn. And that's also making a difference. And then when it, that allows us to now take care of the patient as a whole when they come in one by one. And that usually, if they're very sick enough that needs to be admitted, uh, usually they get steroids. And that does make a dramatic difference. They get supplemental oxygen, we prone them. And uh, depending on where they end up in uh, the hospital with the ICU or the floors, they can sign up and become part of a study for monoclonal antibodies or compassionate care, uh, emergency authorization release. Uh, it all depends where you know, the kind of team that you have and the kind of medical history that you um, come in with COVID. But most of the time, if you have COVID and you have no symptoms and you're not short of breath and you're not hypoxic, we give you a pulse oximeter, we send you home, we tell you to watch out for and good, good return precautions, and you come back when you absolutely need to. And then only then, if you cannot breathe, and you cannot talk, then we intubate you. But that's a 14% survival rate, so we don't want to get there. Right, right. Dr. Potoff, uh, let me ask you about Wisconsin uh, more directly this month. Uh, November, of course, we're, we've talked about the election. Uh, it's a battleground state. We've had events there. Uh, some of uh, the folks that have shown up, they're not wearing masks. Obviously, they can be super spreader events. But not just that. Uh, Dr. Fauci, we talked about uh, him talking about vaccines. But I saw an interview with him earlier talking about Thanksgiving. It's in November. His kids aren't coming to Thanksgiving, and, and people are having to make these tough choices. A lot of them don't want to. Talk to me about your concerns about this month specifically as we talk about this second wave. 
Yeah, this is something we've been messaging to the public, uh, and sometimes we feel like the bears are bad news, but, you know, we'll get asked, what about trick-or-treating? Can kids go trick-or-treating and, and get candy from, you know, people in the community? And we say, you know what, this year, probably not the year to do that. That's pretty high risk. You know, we're really worried about some of the bigger holidays. You know, Thanksgiving in the upper Midwest, uh, people get together, families get together, large families. You know, with the degree of community transmission and uh, how much virus we have in our communities, we can't have families of 20, 30 people getting together uh, on, on Thanksgiving. We're already struggling with hospital capacity. You know, the last thing we need are, are large holiday gatherings. It goes the same for these large gatherings uh, that, that leaders are having occur in our state. Uh, you know, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat or, or whoever you are, uh, the idea that you would hold an event in a state that is struggling so mightily uh, and have people come together in close proximity uh, and certainly spread the disease around uh, is really unfathomable to us who work in medicine. Joseph, let's talk about President Trump. He says uh, we're turning the corner on this pandemic, and yet uh, his chief of staff was on a uh, program this weekend where he said uh, basically we can't really put our arms around the pandemic. Let's listen to what Mark Meadows had to say. Here's what we have to do. We're not going to control the pandemic. We are going to control the fact that we get uh, vaccines, therapeutics, and other mitigation areas because, because it is a contagious virus, just like the flu. Can't control the pandemic. Uh, American exceptionalism, we've heard that over and over again. This is a superpower saying we concede in a way, right? Well, yes. I mean, it's raising the white flag over something that seven months ago, six months ago, we had. If we had the wherewithal, we would not be where we are. We're, we're ahead of India in the number of cases that we get per day and the number of people who have died. And I think part of the issue that we have here is that leadership comes from the top and the plan to do nothing has not been a plan at all. I mean, they just basically have decided to kind of forfeit uh, the, the, any kind of uh, attempts to, to mitigate control of the virus, to mitigate spread of the virus, because the leader, President Trump, does not think it's a big deal. And as we've seen over the course of his presidency, you cross the president or you disagree with him at your peril. Uh, look at uh, uh, Anthony Fauci is, is, is a, a key example here. He was at the forefront of the early days of the task force, started contradicting the president, and now he's almost persona non grata in the White House, the man who is the leading infectious disease expert in the world. So it doesn't surprise me at all that uh, the administration has finally copped to what a lot of us suspected all along, and that is the fact that there was no plan, there is going to be no plan, and the only plan that matters is whether or not he can hold on for another election and hold on in time for, uh, and if he gets reelected, hold on in time for a virus, which may or may not be able to be distributed widely enough to control any kind of spread or future infections. Dr. Potoff, uh, one of the other things we're hearing from the Trump administration, they keep insisting that the surge in cases is actually more testing. Would you agree with that? Uh, you know, if you test more, you'll have more cases. But, you know, currently, especially in Wisconsin, but around the country, you have to look towards other metrics uh, that are, you know, more towards the gold standard. One, we're seeing increased hospitalizations. Um, you know, you don't necessarily get increased hospitalizations with increased testing. Uh, and then worse, we're seeing increased deaths. Uh, deaths is the outcome measure. If you're seeing more deaths, you have a problem, irrespective of how much testing you're doing. Kate, let me ask you about testing, because uh, I was watching the World Series game last night. I grew up in Southern California, so I was rooting for the Dodgers. Justin Turner's playing a great game. Suddenly, he's not there. That's the eighth inning. He's, he's not on the diamond. Uh, it comes out after the game that his test came back positive. The day before, it was inconclusive. That day, it was positive. But he was in the dugout for eight innings. He was out there on the field for eight innings. He was yanked. Then he came out afterwards for all the team photos, took off his mask, all I can think is this is a super spreading event, but tell me, what were your thoughts when you were watching that? Yeah, it is very concerning, and they will have to test the entire team probably for several days, if not uh, several weeks, to, to pick up the cases. Uh, you know, luckily, they have the luxury of doing that testing. And, you know, I look forward to the day when every family can have a testing kit at home so they can test every family member every week or every other week. That's the level of testing that we're going to need in order to, to get our hands around this pandemic. And that was going to be my follow-up question. These guys are tested over and over and over again. He's asymptomatic, thinks he's fine, he's playing eight innings. That tells us a lot about this, this virus, doesn't it? 
Well, yes, we, we know that the majority of people are asymptomatic, but that doesn't, uh, you know, do away with the fact that, you know, over 220,000 people have died from it. And that, you know, when you, when you look at the excess mortality, you know, it, it's quite significant. And, you know, more people are, are dying of COVID than, than anything else in, in the U.S. So it is uh, quite a concern. And we do need to take, you know, important public health measures to, to protect people. There was an interesting natural experiment in Kansas. The uh, governor would not declare a state mandate, but individual counties did. And the counties that did have an indoor mask mandate for public spaces had half the COVID cases compared to counties that didn't. So masks work. We need the leadership from the top to do the mask mandates and to model wearing masks. And Calvin, uh, let's talk a little bit more about that. Uh, the fact that, you know, he was asymptomatic. He played eight innings. I don't want to belabor this, but the fact of the matter is when you're asymptomatic, you can shed a lot of the virus, correct? Yeah, why take the chance? If you're asymptomatic, but then you test positive, do you really want to risk 25 days? I mean, you, you can be and develop symptoms within 25 days of a positive test. We know that if you are tested positive, you can be delayed in de uh, developing symptoms. Why take the risk? It's, it, if you're gonna infect your co uh, teammates and other people around you, your family members, uh, that's something that you have to live with as a, you know, your burden of guilt. So I, I say that if you test positive, whether it's a false positive or not, just self-quarantine and just, if you, you know, just prepare for the, the worst. Uh, the at the very least, you protect yourself and you protect your family members as a result. And, and a lot of times there are tough choices involved, and we're seeing that happening all around the world. Dr. Potoff, as you see the spiraling numbers, uh, what would you say to Dr. I mean, Governor Evers if, if he came to you and said, do we need a shutdown? What, is it got to be targeted, specific? What, what would you suggest? Yeah, you know, I, I'm not sure that you have to do, you know, machete shutdowns where everything is just closed. But, you know, what you do need to do is you need to look at the data you have to find out, you know, where are cases coming from, uh, and you do need more restrictions than what we have right now. Uh, so the idea that every individual just needs to decide for themselves or every business has to make the best decision, uh, you know, that's so confounded with bias, uh, it's really difficult for people to know what to do. So uh, I think you can be strategic about it, uh, but I don't think you can make it a free-for-all. And when do you think you'll turn the corner there in Wisconsin? You know, I think that's a great question, uh, and I wish I had rosy news, but, you know, when I look at our state, you know, every time it seems like we try to enact public health measures across the state, uh, they get struck down. This creates more confusion, more mixed messaging. I don't see anything on the horizon that would tell me that something significant is going to change in Wisconsin. Uh, so I, I don't know when it's going to get better. Um, I don't know what it'll take. But for right now, our curve keeps going up. And we'll just have to wait for that vaccine. Thank you all for joining us. Really appreciate it. That's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Mike Walter in Washington, D.C. Thanks so much for watching.